Scope of preliminary inquiry and registration of FIR under the old as well as the new law is a session which we are taking today by Mr. Asim Pandya, Senior Advocate, former President of Gujarat High Court, Advocates Association. Those who have been connected with the Beyond Law CLC series would know that Mr. Pandya had started patronizing the channel of Beyond Law CLC with his knowledge sharing on not one, but so many sessions. And that's why we keep on looking upon him for sharing his knowledge. He's an avid writer plus prolific speaker. And beyond that, after being connected on social media, I learned that he has got good passion for music as well as badminton. But that only shows that he has a holistic growth, as they all say that professionals have to have every type of knowledge, which makes him an all-rounder. And that's why we all look upon him. Today, since Mr. Pandya was busy, we had changed our routine as such from 6 p.m. to 4.30. But they all say that good things have do different things. Over to you, Mr. Pandya. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vikas, for a nice introduction. The topic which we have chosen today is preliminary inquiry, scope of preliminary inquiry, and registration of FIR. Now, we all know, we have all experienced in our profession as well as in our personal life that when we go to police station for registration of an FIR, many a time it so happens that police refuses to register FIR. Then what are the options available? Secondly, sometimes it so happens that we go to police station and the police station person sitting there would say that the crime has been committed in a different jurisdiction. So this is not a proper police station. You must go to the police station which has jurisdiction to investigate. Third aspect is the scope of preliminary inquiry because now during last 10 years from the judgment in Lalita Kumari's case, this preliminary inquiry has been opened for the first time. We will detail, in detail discuss all these things. But during this 10 years experience, we have seen that in the garb of uh, poli uh, preliminary inquiry, the police officer accepts certain applications. They do not register them as FIR directly. But in the garb of preliminary inquiry, they call upon certain witnesses or proposed accused to the police station. They try to intervene in the matter which is not purely a criminal matter or which cannot be considered to be an offense. And they try to bring pressure on the parties and then they get the matter settled rather than uh, looking into the actual grievance of the parties. So we must understand what is the exact scope of preliminary inquiry because to some extent now it is permitted. And fourth aspect which is most important, we, we are going to discuss all these four aspects. Fourth aspect is there is a considerable ambiguity about the magistrate's power under section 156.3. It so happens that when we move the magistrate seeking his intervention under section 156.3 of the criminal procedure code, he would direct, he would examine the complainant on oath and he would issue inquiry under section 202, which is not prayed for by the parties. So this is our frequent experience as a lawyer and sometimes it, is, it might be a personal experience also. So in this webinar, the principal focus is on the scope of preliminary inquiry plus whether the police officer has power to refuse registration of FIR. So first we will go to the aspect of section 154 which provides for registration of FIR. This action is very simple. It is couched in a very plain and simple language. It says that when police officer, officer in charge of police station receives an information disclosing a cognizable offense, he has to reduce it into writing and then register it as an FIR. A copy of the FIR is to be given to the informant free of cost immediately. 
so that is a short provision now despite these provisions in for force for so many years we have all experienced that in most of the cases which are not purely criminal in nature means uh, pro, uh, the offenses pertaining to properties offenses pertaining to criminal breach of trust uh, offenses pertaining to cheating etc the police routinely refuse to register fir they would register fir only when the offense is pertaining to bodily harm so if it's a 326 307 306 302 they don't mind registering fir such fir but barring such fir's in most of the cases we have experienced that police would refuse to register fir so the law was very clear since 1992 in bhajan lal's case and thereafter in ramesh kumar's case and lastly despite all this clear law the matter was referred to a larger bench because some of the judges thought that there are certain divergent views of supreme court as well as different high courts taking a different view that it is not mandatory to register fir even if it discloses a cognizable offense and the police would be entitled to hold the inquiry preliminary inquiry to set rest this controversy the honorable supreme court in lalita kumari versus government of up which is reported in air 2014 supreme court page 187 has clearly held after considering all those judgments starting from bhajan lal and ramesh kumari etc etc prakash singh badal's case etc it has clearly held that it is a mandate of law so what is a condition precedent for registration of fir the only condition is that the information which is given by a person to the in charge of police station must disclose a cognizable offense the credibility of information genuineness of information all these are not there stated in section 154 the honorable supreme court drew analogy to clarify this aspect from section 41 which provides for power of arrest the supreme court also considered provisions of section 157 which provides that investigation is is not to be started mechanically and there has to be a reason to suspect that a cognizable offense has been committed so only on that premise investigation starts so considering these two sections which has use reasonable suspicion or credible information no such wordings are there in section 154 and therefore the honorable supreme court clearly laid down in lalita kumari that it is a mandate of law the honorable supreme court applied the rule of literal interpretation it went by the literal interpretation and an argument was canvas that under section 154 subsection 3 in the event of refusal to register fir a remedy is provided for to approach superintendent of police with a request that the concerned police officer has not registered fir therefore it shows that it is not mandatory the honorable supreme court said that it is of no consequence the word shall is indicative of the legislative intent that whenever the information discloses a cognizable offense it must be registered so apart from literal interpretation the word shall has also been interpreted and said that it does not leave any doubt Yes, of section one to section three, it is a mandate of law. More importantly, the Supreme Court also stated. I think please, please mute. All are requested to mute themselves, otherwise it creates some disturbance. So I lose track. So so I was on the aspect that that judgment also clearly states that the provisions of criminal procedure code does not contemplate any preliminary inquiry and therefore whenever cognizable offense is disclosed 
the police is mandated to register FIR. Now, Honorable Supreme Court also said that mere registration of FIR does not cause any prejudice to anyone. Why? The reason is that Section 157 provides that despite registration of FIR, a discretion is left in the police officer not to commence investigation. So, registration of FIR does not... Pandeji, once uh, I'm just muting all, then you will, I will allow you to unmute yourself. Pandeji, unmute yourself. Yes. Yeah. I'm audible now? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay. So I was on the point that the registration of FIR does not ipso facto warrant into investigation. The police officer has still discretion whether to investigate or not to investigate. As I said that mere registration of FIR does not cause any prejudice. And once the police officer is deciding to commence investigation, the question of prejudice might occur. But for the time being, what we are, I was discussing is that when police officer takes a decision, not to commence investigation, he will have to record reasons for that and he has to send a report to the magistrate concern. And magistrate concern under section 159, after examining the report, can still order investigation under section 159, which the police might have commenced the investigation, refused to commence the investigation under 157. So there is inbuilt mechanism. So mere registration of FIR does not cause any prejudice. Second aspect is that there are judgments and the Supreme Court has made it clear in many judgments that mere registration of FIR does not automatically warrant into arrest of a person. Because for arrest, there is a separate provision that is Section 41. And Section 41 is hedged by several restrictions. That first of all, he has the police officer must examine the information, whether it is a credible information, whether reasonable suspicion exists that person has committed cognizable offense. And now, in view of subsequent development from 2010, there is a provision which is incorporated that when offense is punishable up to seven years, there are further requirements of recording reasons before uh, arresting a person. So as I pointed out that registration of FIR does not create any prejudice per se. And therefore, the question of holding preliminary inquiry, which is contemplated in Lalita Kumari, which in my submission, once it has been made clear that it is a mandate of law, there was no reason to carve out an exception. Because in one hand, the Judges said that law does not contemplate any kind of preliminary inquiry. Then there was no question of carving out an exception. Because as I said that mere registration, nothing happens. So therefore, there was no scope of any preliminary inquiry once it is held that it is a mandate of law. So this is very clear from the decision in Lalita Kumari's case. Now, coming to the second aspect, that when we go to police station for registering a crime, and many times we have experienced that police would say that this offense which has been committed does not fall within the territorial jurisdiction of the police station. The law is very clear that police has no authority to refuse registration of FIR even if it is offense is committed in some different jurisdiction. There are advisories issued by the central government. 
सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट इन 2013, 2014 एंड 2015 इश्यूड एडवाइजरी टू ऑल स्टेट गवर्नमेंट सेइंग दैट द पुलिस ऑफिसर्स आर शंटिंग द इनफॉर्मेंट्स हु आर कमिंग टू डिस्क्लोज एन ऑफेंस कमीशन एन ऑफेंस बाय सिंपली सेइंग दैट द पुलिस स्टेशन कंसर्न हैज नो टेरिटोरियल जुरिस्टिक्शन नाउ वेदर देर इज एनी कंसेप्ट ऑफ टेरिटोरियल जुरिस्टिक्शन with regard to registration of fir not or fir or not in my view there is no concept of territorial jurisdiction at the time of registration of the fir if you examine the provisions of section 39 and section 40 of crpc section 39 cast a duty on a person who knows that a particular type of cognizable offences are committed to his knowledge to inform to the nearby magistrate or nearest police station so there is no concept that a crime is to be reported to a particular police station only so when this is supported by section 39 first of all then section 40 also contemplates and supports this contention that there is nothing like concept of territorial jurisdiction of a police station and once cognizable offence is disclosed the police must register fir irrespective of the offence where it has been committed in area where the offence has been committed which is known as zero fir because it is not a regular fir once it is within the jurisdiction it has to be given due number proper number but if it is pertaining to any other jurisdiction it is to be registered as zero fir so in practice though this is a clear law we have found that it is not being implemented in its strict sense so i was on section 40 which also said that in village a certain offence suppose unnatural death takes place accidental death takes place or any other serious cognizable offence is committed in the village area then not only the officers of villages but every resident of the village must inform to the nearest police station or to the nearest magistrate about the commission of cognizable offence so i am just trying to point out that when you go to a particular police station and when he refuses to register fir on the ground of territ- lack of territorial jurisdiction you must point it out to him that it is his duty because once it is a duty of the citizen to inform to the nearest police station about the commission of cognizable crime of serious nature under section 39 and section 40 the police officer would not be justified in refusing the registration of fir on the ground that it lacks territorial jurisdiction and i would request you to look to look up to those advisory where the Uh, the central government has circulated to all state governments that this direction of the supreme court which is emanated from the judgment in satvinder kaur's case which is reported in 1999 supreme court cases page 198 so in that case the concept of zero fir was envisaged and thereafter from time to time the su- supreme court as well as the central government has taken up this issue very seriously now coming to the new law you would be very fascinated to know that under the new law that is bhartiya nagrik suraksha samhita now the concept of territorial jurisdiction lack of territorial jurisdiction has been given complete go by now under new section that is section 173 which begins with this phraseology that irrespective of the area where the crime is committed the police officer must register the fir so now that is the additional fact which we must bear in mind because earlier law very soon from 1st july we are, we will have to deal with the new law so new law clearly contemplates that there is no concept of territorial jurisdiction when fir is to be registered second important aspect which was not there in section 154 which is now found in section 173 is that you can register 
FIR through electronic media also. So any electronic medium, like you can give a, a, a mobile call, you can send a detail WhatsApp, you can also send email. So all, our, all these electronic medium are now recognized under section, new section 1733 of BNSS, that is Bharti Nagarik Suraksha Samhita. So two new concepts have been brought in under section 173. One is the concept of territorial jurisdiction is now no more. And secondly, now you can, you will be able to register FIR from 1st July onwards through electronic medium also. And police has to give regular number within a period of three days. Once the information which has been given through electronic media and a person comes and signs the record, then it becomes the regular FIR. So the concept of zero FIR has been now incorporated statutorily under new section. So this is with regard to the registration of FIR. I am not going much into it because it is the law is now clear by the judgment in Lalita Kumari's case. Now coming to the next point, which is very interesting and which is, uh, which is nobody is thinking that how preliminary inquiry, which is contemplated in certain types of cases in Lalita Kumari is grossly abused. Now you all know then in Lalita Kumari's case, in last paragraph, the Honorable Supreme Court said that when the information involves a commercial dispute, when information involves a matrimonial dispute or a family dispute, or uh, the information is grossly delayed, and the Supreme Court said that delayed beyond three months, or there are, there are other restrictions, then in such cases, a preliminary inquiry is contemplated that police should not mechanically register when such things are present because the experience had shown that these provisions have been grossly abused like uh, 406, 420, then matrimonial disputes. So commercial disputes are given color of criminal nature and therefore to avoid such informations being registered as FIR, the Supreme Court has kept it open for the police officer to hold a limited preliminary inquiry. Now, limited inquiry, the Supreme Court has not explained the scope and extent of inquiry. I will give one illustration which I recently faced and you will realize that how these provisions are being grossly abused, holding of preliminary inquiry. The law contemplates under section 154 and section 155 only two registers. Only two registers are to be maintained. One is register of FIR, that is cognizable offenses to be registered in the book of FIR. Then if suppose information discloses a non-cognizable offense, then it is to be registered in a book which is meant for registering non-cognizable offenses and the police officer is duty bound to refer the person concerned to the magistrate for appropriate recourse of law. So as such, law contemplates two registers for cognizable offenses, FIR register, and for non-cognizable, there is a book known as non-cognizable cases book. So there is no concept of receiving a third type of application. Either it discloses a cognizable offense, so you must register FIR. If it does not disclose a cognizable offense, but it simply discloses a non-cognizable offense, then you should simply register in NC book and refer him to the magistrate. Where is the concept of entertaining or maintaining a separate book of applications? Now, what happens when such an application register is permitted under the law of the Supreme Court? During last 10 years, you will have experienced that so many commercial matters, so many civil disputes are given color of criminal matter. The applications are moved before the police station. Police station in the garb of holding preliminary inquiry will call upon proposed accused or his relatives or his friends or whoever may be acquainted with the, uh, the information to the police station. Now in the police station, they not only record the statements 
of such persons but they also ask them to sign such statements so and these things happen not only once one can understand that once summons is issued and one person comes and attends the police station and then he gives a statement matter doesn't end there i was on the point that i had recently experienced one case where somebody purchased a property which was already mortgaged to the bank and it was a matter subject matter of drt proceedings there was an attachment of the bank despite that the purchaser moved the police station and said that he has been duped by the seller not the bank that he has sold him the property which was known to him that it had been mortgage with the bank and it was subject matter of attachment before the drt now there was no fault on the part of the bank officers but in the garb of holding preliminary inquiry the highest officers of the bank were summoned twice they attended they gave statement thereafter also the matter did not end there repeated summons were and summons it was it, it cannot be termed as summons in gujarat it is known as samaj yadi so there is no reference of any section under what provisions they are issuing such kind of notices asking the person to remain present in the police station so the police the highest officer from bombay was repeatedly called at the police station he was uh, given phone calls by the police officer ultimately the person concerned got tired the bank officer got tired and ultimately he was made to enter into a compromise where the dues of the bank were more than 4 crores but he entered into a compromise to settle the matter for 2 crores so this is the nature of preliminary inquiry which is being conducted by police which is absolutely not permissible today i am going to focus mainly on this aspect to make the point clear that if this kind of preliminary inquiry is permitted it would open the flood gates of corruption for police and police would be enjoying such powers which is not contemplated in the provisions of crpc now appreciate that calling a person is a part of investigation now you must bear a distinction because everything turns on what is investigation and what is preliminary what to what extent preliminary inquiry can be permitted to be done now prior to we can divide the issue about holding of preliminary inquiry pre lalita kumari's case and post lalita kumari's case now if we talk about the law which was prevalent prior to lalita kumari's decision i have examined and in my opinion there are no such judgments that permit holding of a preliminary inquiry prior to registration of fir there are three decisions which i will refer to shortly where to some extent similar issue arose but there is no definite authoritative decision given by the honorable supreme court that yes the code of criminal procedure contemplates holding of a preliminary inquiry before registration of fir the first judgment which i am going to refer to is judgment which is reported in air 1964 supreme court page 221 and the name of the party is uh, state of up versus bhagwant kishor joshi please note down this judgment because this is the first judgment where something sort of arguments were canvassed that such powers are already there uh, with the police but the supreme court negated but there is a dissenting judgment of justice mudholkar which i will refer to very shortly now in this case the issue was under the prevention of corruption act the prevention of corruption act provided that no police officer below the rank of deputy superintendent of police can investigate investigate any offense pertaining to matter under the prevention of corruption act now in this case once police sub inspector received some information from his superior that one booking clerk railway booking clerk that is respondent bhagwant kishor joshi 
was misappropriating the amount collected by him during the booking and that is how the criminal breach of trust and cheating is done by that person so without taking authorization which was contemplated in law he directly reached the spot he collected certain evidence he examined certain books which were maintained by that railway authorities and thereafter after some time he obtained authorization from the magistrate and thereafter he uh, registered a regular case and conducted investigation later on now in this case trial court convicted the person but high court said that these steps which were you are arguing that it is preliminary inquiry are actually part of investigation because word investigation simply means that going to the spot collecting evidence recovery or discovery of evidence arrest of the accused all these are part or steps of investigation and here the police sub inspector who was not authorized because deputy superintendent of police was authorized under the law to conduct investigation so supreme court said that whatever steps which that police sub inspector took before the authorization obtained from the magistrate were part of investigation and it cannot be considered as preliminary inquiry and therefore the high court was uh, the high court's judgment was set aside on other ground because high court said that it would be investigation and therefore the trial court's order would be contrary to law supreme court upheld one portion of the judgment that yes it is part of investigation but the honorable supreme court said that there was no prejudice caused to the accused by conduct of that investigation which was done by the police sub inspector therefore ultimately the trial court order was sustained now in this judgment there is a dissenting opinion of justice mudolkar where we will find some light about the preliminary inquiry he said that if some unknown information uh, information from unknown source is received or vague or very general information is received the source is not that authentic authenticate then in that case just to lend assurance to what whether it is correct whether it discloses a cognizable offense when the information is correct or not the person police officer concerned is entitled to hold a limited preliminary inquiry and that preliminary inquiry must be a discrete preliminary inquiry discrete preliminary inquiry means it should he should obtain information from his own sources it would not mean that he can call witnesses or the proposed accused to the police station because in the entire crpc there is no concept of calling a person to the police station because it's it is considered that investigation has to take place at the place of crime not in the police station police police officer cannot sit in the chamber of his chamber in the police station and conduct investigation that is not the concept envisaged under the provisions of crpc so therefore the definition of investigation also important and the provisions of section 154 156 and 157 is important where there is clear indication that whenever investigation is commenced the police officer is supposed to go to the spot he is required to collect evidence he is try he has to discover the evidence he has to arrest the person if he it is required so these are the steps of investigation and something which is not in that nature can only be considered as preliminary inquiry as per the decision dissenting opinion of mudolkar so he was of the view that what police sub inspector did in that case was simply preliminary inquiry and therefore also there was uh, nothing wrong with the conviction which was given by the trial court now this judgment was the stand alone judgment for so many years the second judgment which i am referring to is shashikant versus cbi which is reported in 2007 scc so in shashikant versus cbi also it was a matter pertaining to cbi a person who was a servant employee he made anonymous complaint about his superiors and other officer that they were indulging into corruption the 
CBI conducted preliminary inquiry. Preliminary after preliminary inquiry, they did not register a regular case, which is a normal procedure. But only departmental inquiry were held against the officer concerned. In this background, the person who has sent anonymous information approached the court that no, FIR should be registered and appropriate action be action should be taken. So in Again, in Shashikant, it was a case of CBI. CBI manual clearly contemplates preliminary inquiry. CBI manual stands on a different footing because it is uh, the investigation is conducted under the Delhi Special Establishment Police Establishment Act, and there is a different set of procedure where because the, because of the specific reason that they are concerned with essentially with public servants and public servant should not be unnecessarily harassed and therefore there has to be a mechanism to weed out certain information before registering a regular FIR. So CBI manual has clearly contemplated a preliminary inquiry and in that background the Supreme Court held that yes there is a power to hold preliminary inquiry with the CBI but that would be inappropriate to may applicable to the offenses under CRPC or IPC. Now, a broad statement came to be made in Shashi Khan's case by probably by Justice S.B. Sinha that under CRPC also a pre preliminary inquiry can be conducted. So he said that it is not unknown that such a preliminary inquiry is also conducted in the uh, under the CRPC also. But for making such a broad statement, the learned judge has not referred to any authoritative decision of the Supreme Court or any statutory provision. So the, that broad statement is not a law duly supported by judgments of the Supreme Court or statutory provision. Now, when in the same year, second judgment was there, that is Rajinder Singh Katoch versus Chandigarh Delhi administration that is reported in 2007 10 SCC, page 63. In that case, it was a case of a pure civil dispute. There was a dispute between two brothers about the ancestral property and right to possess that property. One brother filed a FIR, um, made, made, uh, made a complaint to the concerned officer saying that he has been illegally restrained from entering it to his ancestral property and the other brother is guilty of criminal trespass, etc., etc. So that application did not yield desired result in favor of the, that application. Ultimately, matter reached Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, unfortunately, rather than basing its opinion on the aspect whether the preliminary inquiry is possible to be conducted, because in that case, uh, after information was given by that brother, some sort of preliminary inquiry was conducted and it was found that there was no truth in the information given by the brother. So ultimately, no FIR was filed. So in that case, again, the question arose whether preliminary inquiry is contemplated in law or not. And the Supreme Court relied on the decision in Shashikant versus CBI, which is pertaining to CBI inquiry, where there is a specific recognition of the power of holding preliminary inquiry. So that judgment has been wrongly applied in the case of Rajinder Singh Katoj and it was held that the preliminary inquiry is justified. Now there are, why I am focusing on this point, because there are serious problems when police is permitted to hold preliminary inquiry and in the garb of preliminary inquiries, police is permitted to take actions which are pertaining to investigation, like calling a person to the police station, which is most objectionable thing and recording statement. Now, why it is objectionable? Because when a person is called at the police station, he is not an accused. So his statement, if it is recorded and his signature is obtained, it can be used as an evidence against him. So statutory protection, that is under section 161, the sta sta uh, 162, the statement recorded under 161, after investigation has commenced, cannot be relied during the trial and they are not to be signed. Please uh, uh, remember this, that 161 statements 
are not supposed to be signed by the person and they cannot be relied at the time of trial. So there is a protection that a police records particular statement, it is not to be signed and it, it cannot be used as evidence in the trial court. Similarly, Section 25 of the Evidence Act, Section 12, 25 of the Evidence Act that no confessional statement made to the police by an accused of an offence is admissible. Now, when preliminary inquiry is held, there is no formal accusation at all. So, Section 25 Evidence Act, Section 26 of the Evidence Act, also that protection is also taken away. Similarly, the protection under Article 20, sub Article 3, that no person shall be compelled to be a witness against himself. There also, judicial opinions are very clear that unless a person is formally stamped as an accused, that protection against testimonial compulsion will not begin. So, now realize, when preliminary inquiry is held, a person is called in the police station, his statement is recorded, and suppose the police relies on that statement during the trial, what would happen? The, the answer is obvious. The police, the prosecution can argue that he was not an accused and therefore it is not a statement under 161, which is, which is protected. It is not a confessional statement because he is not an accused and he is not an accused and therefore the right against the testimonial compulsion will also not begin. So such a statement is likely to go into evidence and it is it can be argued plausibly argued by the prosecution that it has no protection constitutional or statutory protection and therefore it can go into the evidence so this is a very serious aspect which we must bear in mind and whenever any person any police officer in the garb of preliminary inquiry calls your client to a police station for recording a statement you must instantaneously challenge such a summons because you will find that summons will have no statutory provision bearing on the summons. It would simply known as samajyadi or some side kind of communication which has no statutory backing and you can argue that preliminary inquiry which is contemplated and in the case of Lalita Kumari is a discrete inquiry which should not affect the liberty of individual because I am compelled by a summons or samaji adi to attend the police station. And I fear that if I don't attend the police station, there is possibility that police might register another case against me that I am obstructing or I am not cooperating the investigating agency in carrying out the his, his performing his duties. So in this background, whenever such a things happen or sometimes even specimen signatures are also obtained during the preliminary inquiry and preliminary inquiry all these pressurizing tactics are being adopted by police just to extract money from both the parties the application is taken because somebody has paid money to police police officer and you would be pressurized to settle the matter or you will be asked to pay some amount to consign the complaint of the informant to record. So you must object to whenever you get an opportunity. I am proposing to challenge such a thing whenever an opportunity comes. In fact, that in bank case, I, I got an opportunity. I was about to convince the court, but unfortunately, in the meantime, the settlement took place. So we should try to see that whenever these things happen, you must challenge. And you must point out by reference to the provisions of law that in the garb of preliminary inquiry, the police cannot be permitted to conduct investigation or steps that are pertaining to investigation. So that is some and substance of this scope and extent. And therefore, what I am trying to point out is that, that preliminary inquiry, which is contemplated by Mudholkarje, Justice Mudholkarje as a dissenting view, has made it very clear that it should be a discrete inquiry from his own source. You should not affect somebody's liberty. Nobody can be called at police station and 
only there is one provision which permits calling a person to the police station that is section 160 of crpc and that to a limited class of people persons residing in the same police station or adjoining police station who is acquainted with the facts of the case otherwise in every case police has to go to the scene of crime or where the crime has taken place he has to record statement going there at the place and collect the evidence at the place of crime and he is not supposed to sit idle or sitting in the police station calling somebody here and somebody there and collecting evidence in his own way now section 160 also will not come at the time of investi uh, in pre preliminary inquiry because it contemplates investigation section 160 summons can be issued when investigation is on not at the preliminary stage so if they refer to section 160 you can question that this is not permissible at the preliminary inquiry and only if registration of fir is there or the police has already started investigation by sending report under section 157 then section 160 can be invoked second apprehension or somebody argues that section 41a summons will be issued section 41a summons can be issued to the accused only and that to only after registration of fir in compliance in compliance with section 41 sub clause 1 clause b of crpc so neither section 41 capital a permits calling any other person witnesses unless he is tempted as a accused and that section 41 a summons can be confined to accused only section 160 can be to any other person provided there is already investigation so my endeavor today is to point out that we should clearly bear in mind the distinction between investigation and power to hold inquiry so since the honorable supreme court has already permitted such kind of preliminary inquiry we will have to confine and we will have to restrict that scope of inquiry which does not affect the statutory right of any person including accused either constitutional or statutory right under crpc or evidence act so this is about the uh, this preliminary inquiry now under the new code there is a specific provision which permits preliminary inquiry so section 173 subsection 3 now permits a limited preliminary inquiry but the wordings are very important because now preliminary inquiry would be permitted in respect of offences punishable with 3 years or more or less than 7 years so less than 7 years please keep it in mind the distinction between the offence punishable up to 7 years or more here it is clearly stated that 3 years or more but less than 7 years so in respect of the offences which are punishable with more than 7 years now no preliminary inquiry can be contemplated under the bhartiya nagrik suraksha sanhita section 173 sub section 3 so this we must bear it in mind therefore again the question would in future arise whether offences involving more than 7 years punishment whether preliminary inquiry can be permitted in the light of the decision in the case of lalita kumari so that question the supreme court will have to answer in due course but for the time being we are at least happy that this preliminary inquiry is limited to only minor offences less than 7 years so if you give an information the police will not have any right to hold preliminary inquiry at all so this is on preliminary inquiry now coming to the last topic we will quickly do it that is power under 1563 we have come across large number of judgments that in at least in gujarat there are three important decision one is of 1986 one is of 1997 and one is of 1998 in all these cases in most of the cases they arose directly to the uh, the cases arose from the complaint which had been directly filed before the magistrate and magistrate consent without undertaking 
inquiry or issuing process himself just to shirk his responsibility he ordered investigation under section 1563 so that he may not have to conduct inquiry or he may not have to issue process so in this background these three judgments are delivered by the gujarat high court one is in arvind ravji bhai patel another is in indravadan p shah's case and third one i do not remember but these are the three cases one is of justice mb shah another is of justice sm soni and another third one is of justice kj vaidya now in one judgment the high court said that 156 three order should not be mechanically passed and it must reflect application of mind and the court also directed that decision to be circulated to all judicial officer in the state of gujarat so after that judgment in state of gujarat the order under section 1563 has become a rarity so after that judgment most of the judges trial court judges follow that judgment and say that okay they, since the honorable high court has said that we should not mechanically order 1563 we we reject your application now the important issue is that to invoke what are the condition precedent to invoke in my personal view and which is supported by the decisions that to, if you want to invoke section 156 you must first approach the police station concerned under section 154 1 so you must make an attempt to register an fir suppose that attempt has not given a desired result or it has been ignored or the police officers are concerned has refused to register fir then there is second option that is section 154 sub section 3 you should also make an effort to approach the superintendent of police with a request to start investigation or to order investigation as contemplated and regi by registering fir if these these two conditions are fulfilled then only you can you are entitled to invoke section 156 sub section 3 because section 156 3 falls in this particular chapter which is pertaining to information and up, which ends up to filing of the charge sheet whereas section 190 which provides for taking of cognizance by magistrate and section 200 which provides for filing of a private complaint are in a separate chapter so taking clue from the fact that section 200 contemplates entirely a different thing we are not concerned with when we are invoking 1563 we should be very specific that we are invoking 1563 power of magistrate to order investigation and the condition precedent is that you must have invoked section 154 and 1543 failing which if the magistrate despite that if the magistrate passes an order of 156 it would be vulnerable because there are now two three judgments which started from judgment in priyanka shrivastav and then latest judgment in babu venkatesh versus state of karnataka which is reported in 2022 scale so in babu venkatesh the honorable supreme court after referring to judgment in priyanka shrivastava case has laid down three conditions for invoking section 1563 first condition is that you should have approached police under section 1541 you approach the police uh, superintendent of police under section 1543 and despite that if it has not given the desired result if the police has failed to register a fir in respect of a cognizable offence then you would be entitled to approach magistrate by an application specific application under 1563 and additional requirement which has been laid down by in babu venkatesh case that that application should be duly supported by an affidavit so what the magistrate when you approach under 150 for 1563 that application must be supported by an affidavit only if these three conditions are fulfilled the magistrate would, would be justified in ordering investigation under section 1563 now in what cases 1563 can be invoked in what cases section 200 can be invoked there are large number of 
different views of different high courts but in my personal view both are absolutely distinct section 200 complaint if you contemplate that uh, if you read that provision you would realize that complaint can be in respect of non cognizable offenses also it does not preclude a person from filing a complaint with regard to cognizable offense but when section 155 of crpc contemplates that when you approach police station and police find that the offense is the information discloses only non cognizable offense then what is the option left he has to refer it to the magistrate concerned so where he has to go he has to invoke section 200 because it is a non cognizable offense so predominantly section 200 is meant for invoking non cognizable complaint with regard to non cognizable offenses but i must make it clear that it does not preclude a person from invoking section 200 in respect of cognizable offense also <clears throat> now therefore the test is where a person without police intervention without police aid is in a position to collect the evidence and prove his case in the court of law then he has to invoke section 200 because there is no requirement of police assistance there is no requirement of investigation he has sufficient material mostly in all commercial matters where criminal breach of trust is there cheating is there in most of the cases the informant is having all the documents all the entries and whatever material he might have it might be possible to prove case in the court of law so in such cases where the police intervention is not necessary a person has to invoke section 200 but when case involves a cognizable offense of a complex nature or even if it is a commercial uh, 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 transaction but in invo it involves forgery and many other such very complicated issues which cannot be proved by the private complainant under section 200 complaint by his own efforts then and he thinks or the judge thinks that without the effective assistance of police material will not be possible to be collected then he has to order section 156 so in a complaint under section 200 also magistrate is entitled to order investigation under 1563 but that would be a different thing where the judge comes to a conclusion that yes here police assistance is needed and what i am talking about is a separate application of different kind under section 1563 and it should be uh, with supporting affidavit and it should be preceded by two steps which i have already spoken of so only if this kind and additional requirement is that <coughs> by the judge made law is that when a magistrate orders 1563 the order must reflect application of mind and addressing the issue whether police assistance to investigate case is necessary or not only if these conditions are fulfilled you would be entitled to file 1563 application and magistrate would be justified in ordering 1563 investigation by registering fir and commencing investigation so please bear in mind section 200 is distinct and section 1563 is different now what i spoke just now about babu venkatesh judgment now in bhartiya nagrik shuraksha samhita it has been been incorporated in the form of statutory provision so now it is section 175 subsection 3 which clearly incorporates the law laid down by priyanka shrivastava followed in babu venkatesh and vijay uh, kailash vijay varge these are the three decisions they that throw light on the power of magistrate under section 1563 so those requirement which was laid down by a judge made law is now incorporated in bhartiya nagrik suraksha samhita in the form of section 1753 but there are two additional requirements which are incorporated as i pointed out that approach to police under 154 now it is 173 one 
and approach to superintendent under 154.3. Now it is 173, subsection 3. And affidavit, application with support of the affidavit. And additional requirement judge has to comply with is that if he finds from the inquiry, by necessary inquiry, and after hearing the submission of the police officer. So these are two additional requirements which is incorporated under new section. So not only these three steps, but now additional requirement that judge must, by necessary inquiry, find that this is a case worth sending for police investigation. And that satisfaction and opportunity to the police to give his submissions with regard to ordering police investigation into the matter. on Because it, it, it's quite possible that on the basis of the application, he might have done certain preliminary steps of holding inquiry. And he is uh, seized of many such material, which would go to show that the police investigation is not at all required. So police officer is given one opportunity to object to the ordering of police investigation under section 175 subsection 3. So this is all about the today's uh, discussion. And uh, I, I am really glad that Mr. Vikas has given me this opportunity to share my views on this important aspect. And during this practice, my practice as a, for all these years, most of the people are ignoring the aspect of scope and extent of preliminary inquiry. They are not realizing the lurking danger in permitting police to conduct preliminary inquiry because only police is interested in getting the civil uh, the um, transactions of civil nature settled by resorting to this preliminary inquiry so it is very important that th this is decided one one thing i forgot that in lalita kumari's case also there is a reference that inquiry word inquiry denotes only magisterial inquiry so we can also argue in a given case that when police is holding preliminary inquiry, all safeguards that are available at this stage of investigation should per se be made applicable to the steps that are taken under the preliminary inquiry. Because in Lalita Kumari, it has been stated that inquiry means only magisterial inquiry, either under section 159 or section 200 or any sort of magistrate inquiry is known to be a preliminary inquiry. There is no concept of preliminary inquiry by police. So that inquiry is different. And therefore, it has one word which has been used in Lalita Kumari is that inquiry after before the registration of FIR or investigation after the registration of FIR, both stand on the same footing. So, if at all such situation arises, we can take clue from this judgment or if the judge is not willing to follow that, then we will have to argue that no such preliminary inquiry is permitted because it would violate the rights under section 162, uh, section 25, 26 of the Evidence Act and section article 20 of the Constitution of India. So I thank you, Mr. Vikas, for giving me this opportunity and I'm thankful to all the persons who have joined this webinar. And I hope this uh, webinar would be certainly useful to all concerned. Of course, sir. As usual, your session gives us good, good insights. There's one question by Vyas. He says, when the FIR is registered in an old law, then the new law will be applicable to old law too uh, when the matter is filed in the court? No, it, it will be applicable from 1st July. So whatever FIRs are already registered, or whatever investigations already commence would remain unaffected by the new law. New law will have to be implemented from 1st July 2024. Next is summons to witness under section 162 to persons within the police station of neighboring police station. And can it be said that the PE, a person residing beyond the jurisdiction, beyond his station or neighboring state cannot be summoned? Yes, certainly. We have objected to it and we have got stay also in many cases, such cases. So it is confined to the local jurisdiction of the police station where investigation is going on or adjoining police station. So if, if you want to summon somebody from other uh, 
jurisdiction, it is not permissible under 160. Uh, I will just check it out on the YouTube if we have some session. We any question? The uh, generally it is full of phrases on the YouTube, so they are in sync with what we are saying. They have actually cherished what we have learned from you today, and it's always an enriching session from your side. Thank you, sir, for sharing the knowledge. I'm just sharing the tomorrow's topic. This is modes of challenge to a decree by Mr. S. R. Somashekar, a former district judge from Bangalore. Do stay connected with us tomorrow at 6 p.m. And thank you, Mr. Pandya, for sharing the knowledge. Thank you. And we always get ourselves enriched and keep looking forward for your patronage. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Stay blessed. Thank you.